Hi all, the webcast is now live. Good evening, everybody. It's 6.30 on Thursday, the 15th of October, 2020, and we are commencing the meeting of the full council at Basingstoke and Dean. I'm Councillor Diane Taylor, Mayor of Basingstoke and Dean, and I'll be chairing this meeting. Welcome to all councillors, participants, and viewers to this council meeting, which is being held in accordance with the council's rules for virtual meetings, which in turn reflect the government's published regulations. This meeting is being streamed live on YouTube and will also be available to view after the meeting has finished. Just going to reiterate one or two key points of procedure. Councillors are identified by name on the screen and I will introduce them by name before they address the council. It's impossible to monitor the screens to see adequately actual raised hands, so councillors who wish to speak should use the raised hand button and switch this off when they've spoken. I'm content for councillors to interrupt without using the raised hand button only if they have a point of order or a point of personal explanation. Can councillors please ensure that their mobile phones are now switched off or are on silent, along with any other devices which could interfere with the proceedings? Councillors should turn on their video link during the meeting and keep their microphones muted unless I have invited them to speak. Councillors are reminded that if they switch off their video link or move away from the camera, they will be treated as leaving the meeting and will not be able to take part in any vote on the item under discussion. As far as agreeing recommendations is concerned, I can't, as is the usual way, visually check that all councillors are happy with the recommendation. I will therefore, following the introduction of the item, ask if there is any dissent which would prompt a debate. If no one raises their virtual hand to indicate dissent, I will take it that we can agree the recommendation without discussion. Obviously, if there is dissent, we will debate and vote. Voting will be taken by roll call. Before voting commences, all councillors will be asked to turn their microphones on. Each councillor will then be asked to indicate whether they are for or against the motion or recommendation or whether they wish to abstain. Once their vote has been cast, councillors should switch off their microphones again. Officers present will only switch their video link on during the proceedings when they're presenting or where they wish to be invited to speak by me as the chair. I will confirm the name of any visiting speakers at the appropriate time in the agenda and invite them to speak via audio link. If councillors have any problems with their connection, please advise the democratic support officer who is there to help. Okay, now, as is customary, may I invite the Mayor's chaplain, Dr Andy Taylor, to say if few words and pray. Councillors who do not wish to take part in this item may of course switch off their sound. Um, over to Andy, thank you. Good evening and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I think you can you hear me but I'm not sure you can see me but uh, uh, all uh, right, I've got an instruction to start my video now. We, we can hear you and we can Great. now see you, thank you. Great. You're there in the glorious Technicolor, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, over the months that I've been uh, kicking off some of these council meetings, I've often shared some Bible verses which um, reflect what I like to call the topsy-turvy kingdom of God. These are principles that Jesus and later his apostles taught that seem to be uh, somewhat contrary to the, the sort of thing, principles that we often see in the world around us. I've got another one today. 
This one is from Matthew 20, verse 26, and it says this, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Uh, John, John C. Maxwell uh, has been a world-renowned American trainer in leadership skills. Probably his heyday was about 20 years ago, but he, he was world-renowned in his training of leadership skills. And he made this one of his fundamental tenets. Good followership is a prerequisite for good leadership. And uh, he later sort of said things, if we, uh, if we had better followership training, we probably wouldn't need as much leadership training. Um, I don't know that those of you of a certain age like me will remember a, a film of the 80s that was quite interesting called The Karate Kid. And in this film, there was a, the, the hero was a young lad called Daniel who was being bullied by some, uh, some older lads who were karate who were trained in karate and um during as, he, as he's getting desperate he, he gets to know the janitor of his apartment block who's a, a an elderly japanese man and um he finds that this man is a is a karate teacher and trainer and expert so he asks him to teach him karate and the guy agrees so his first lesson, he's expecting to learn all the karate skills. The guy takes him to a, a line of cars and he says to him, I want you to polish these cars. And he goes pointedly, polish on, polish off, polish on, polish off. And he's very frustrated, but he does this job and he comes back and he now, now uh, thinks he's going to get on with it. So he says his next lesson is he takes him out to a long fence and he gives him a pot of paint and he says, paint this fence. And he goes, paint on, up and paint down, paint up and down. And this lad Daniel's getting very, very frustrated and thinking he's just being used to do all, all his uh, this janitor's jobs for him. And uh, but in actual fact, what he's doing is training him. And uh, he's training him in humility. He's training him in servanthood. He's also giving him the physical skills he needs to be good at karate. And of course, in the end, he, he learns, he does learn karate. And in the climax, he goes into a karate contest in which he defeats the leader of these bullies. And uh, everyone lives happily ever after until you get to Karate Kid 2. Anyway. Um, in my church, um, I always have to consider that the one who puts out the chairs before the, our service starts, the one who makes the tea and coffee afterwards, and the one who washes up at the end, are just as important as the one who preaches a sermon up front. In God's economy, the way up is down. It's my little message. So can we now pray, please? I'd like to pray, obviously, over the COVID situation. So, Father God, we just uh, we just come to you in a time of crisis in our nation. Um, we do appreciate the relatively low levels that we find in our own town, and that is great for us, but uh, we don't want to be complacent about that. We do pray for our hospital we pray for St. Michael's Hospice and the many, many care homes around our borough that are facing such challenging times yet again. We pray for their workers, many of whom have to camp out in the home in order to be able to work in that bubble. We pray for those who uh, are like have lost or are likely to lose their jobs, those who find themselves homeless as the weather gets colder and wetter. And we pray for them. We pray for the agencies who are supporting them in this time. We pray for our schools and with them, the teachers and the pupils at this challenging time. Lord, would you bless them and help them? Would you pr protect them? We pray also for our government. And uh, we do pray, Lord, that our government and our parliament will have wisdom as we stumble our way through this crisis 
And uh, we do pray that you'll just help them and give them wisdom to lead us at this time. And finally, Lord, we just pray for our, our own council. We thank you for, for the men and the women here, the officers, the elected members of the council who give so much of their time and energy in order to make this, this town a better place. We just pray for the meeting tonight that, uh, that you will bring wisdom and peace onto this, into this Zoom meeting and that the decisions that are made tonight will be good for this town. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much to the Mayor's Chaplain. Thank you for that. Right, is everybody with us? Let's move on now to the first item on tonight's agenda, which is to receive apologies for absence. I've received apologies from Councillor Mark Taylor and Councillor Sean Keating. Can I ask the group leaders to indicate if they've received any other apologies from members? Madam Mayor, um, I put the apologies in for Councillor Lane Still. Thank you very much. Councillors McCormick or Tilbury? Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor Ruth Cooper. Thank you very much. Councillor Tilbury? No. And Councillor Gavin James? Okay, thank you very much. That's all of the absentees. Um, next, we move to declarations of interest. Can you indicate electronically if you wish to declare an interest in any item on the agenda? Councillor Carolyn Wooldridge. Um, I'd like to declare an interest in uh, agenda item eight. Um, I work for Sovereign and they're mentioned in this uh, item. So uh, on advice, I've decided um, not to uh, participate in this item or vote on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No? Can you take your hand down, Councillor Wooldridge, please? Thank you. Right, uh, item number three, minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of July, 2020. Um, this was the full council meeting and it's on pages 11 to 28. Um, I'm, this is obviously for accuracy only. So I will move this from the chair if there's nobody who wishes to take issue with anything. And seconded by. It's seconded by me, sorry. <laughs> it's on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, those are accepted. Item number four, we have um, a couple of announcements. First of all, I believe the council leader would like to say something. Councillor Rattigan. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I mean, I just, um, it is a time for reflection on where we are in terms of our COVID world. And I thought perhaps something from me uh, to reiterate how well as a borough we have acted within these, these months and a reflection perhaps on, on what we've done in some of the aspects of our life that we've moved on. All of us have been impacted both in our society uh, and the way we live our lives. As a council, uh, we have met the challenges of COVID head on and continue to focus on the provision of our essential services. This borough has supported many residents, businesses and our communities. It's important to emphasize that in addition to delivering our existing services, whatever national restrictions uh, have been imposed upon us, this COVID pandemic has met a raft of new activity uh, to which officers and ourselves have supported our communities. These include, but are not um, merely these things, the 28 community hubs to provide frontline assistance in terms of food parcels, medication. 18,000 hours of officer time has gone into supporting them since March till the end of July. The establishment of an ongoing support of virtual meetings of which we're having one tonight to enable this council to continue the business and continue to ensure that we maintain the highest standards of governance and accountability. Administering the council tax rebilling for residents for so that April and May, um, at the height of the first wave of the pandemic, were the free months and then moved to later in the year. That involved 
building again 70,000 uh, uh, homes, a huge administrative um, burden. But the administration of the range of central government um, funded support, including rent payment holidays, business grants, small business discretionary grants, administering the financial support to BVA. And I, I'd like to put on record my thanks to, to the chair of that and all who work in BVA for their time and their efforts for all our community groups. Establishing and continuing to operate our COVID specific governance teams via the strategic emergency management uh, closure and reopening of 200 council facilities. Those included um, our, our play parks, our sports facilities, delivering an ongoing and extensive communications program for officers, us as members, local businesses, and the public through internal bulletins and our communications uh, on our website. These have included to our parish councils who have been, uh, in my experience, very grateful for the updates that we've provided them. And hopefully it's helped you members in your work with your communities to be able to talk about things with first-hand knowledge of what is going on uh, in us, uh, in our borough. Supporting the enforcement of the national COVID regulations through teams such as our licensing and environmental health uh, and our CSPOs who have done a marvellous job in cajoling uh, without enforcing with too heavy a hand some of the restrictions that are placed upon our public. With such a huge burden, it is right that I thank our staff who have been redeployed to focus on the community hub. The majority of the staff have had to incorporate COVID-19 activity into their daily lives, while naturally working in the most part from home, which has meant a burden on our IT services uh, and an ability to make sure that they have the right equipment to continue to do the jobs that they do so well. That said, we have done we looked after over 85,000 inquiries to our, our helplines and our, our uh, customer care numbers. That is a huge burden, uh, one that has been taken up with good humour and an understanding that not everybody has, has an ability to speak um, in the language of, their, or, or, of English and therefore they've made provisions for them too. We've had nearly 500 planning applications approved in that time. Unfortunately, we've had to collect over 156 tons, 156,000 tons um, of fly tipping. 46,000 bags of litter have been collected from our parks where people have enjoyed walking with their families and have taken time to enjoy the natural environment of our part of North Hampshire. We've managed to cut 10 million square meters of grass. Now that's, that's a huge amount, but to, to make the beauty of our borough better, uh, our frontline staffs have worked over and above what you would expect. And they have done it without complaint or questioning. And I admire them for that. Over 250 building regulations have, have, have been produced. But underpinning all of that uh, and the additional related work of COVID has been the work of many officers, not least Dave in our CPSO team who was awarded uh, an honour from Her Majesty the Queen in the last week. We should be very proud of our staff. They reflect well upon us and we'll reflect well upon the borough. There is almost nothing I could say that would boost them up other than the thanks of you as members and the thanks of our public who appreciate what has happened. And uh, I was lucky enough today to see the satisfaction levels from our residents on the bin collections. Those have improved now that we've moved back from alternative weekly collections back to our normal service of weekly grey bins. That is a great testament to what we have done as a borough. You should be rightly proud. 
for those staff who have been working from home have continued to focus on their, their day jobs, making sure that it is business as usual and the services are delivered to our residents, making sure the homeless are homed and, and those without help get the benefits that they require to move on with their lives. There is much to do and we over the next few months will have to do a lot more shoulder to the wheel to make sure that we come through this second wave of the pandemic. But I encourage you all to be proud of your borough, proud of your officers, but most of all, be proud of your residents who you represent, because this is a great borough and we will continue to be so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just following on from what Councillor Rattigan has just said, um, there was an excellent response to the big thank you week in which hundreds of local people who've gone out of their way to help others during the pandemic were nominated by appreciative people to receive, receive special thanks. Um, please, please do continue to let me know if anyone you know deserves our appreciation for their kindness and dedication. Just a couple of other quick things, um, just to say that Black History Month started on the 1st of October and ends at the end of the month. Full programme of discussions and events has been organised and I'm grateful that we have such a proactive group of people who take responsibility of this year by year. Remembrance commemorations next month sadly will have to be done virtually and shown at the appropriate times on social media platforms. I shall personally greatly miss the many people who would normally take part in the ceremony at the War Memorial ending with a march past. So sad that won't happen this year. But we do what we can in the current circumstances. So please consider tuning in on Remembrance Sunday, the 8th of November, and Armistice Day, Wednesday, the 11th of November. And finally, finally, just to say with sadness that this is the last council meeting that will be overseen by Dave Byrne, Interim Democratic Services Manager. He will be very greatly missed. He has done a superb job and stayed sane and cheerful throughout his time with us. How is that possible? I am sure you will join me in wishing him well for the future. Thank you, that's the announcements done. Um, let's move on now to agenda item five, questions from members of the public. Um, as you see from your order papers and your updates, we've got seven questions, and I think all of them are addressed to the Cabinet Member for Planning, Infrastructure and Natural Environment, Councillor Raphael. So can I first of all welcome Mr Paul Beavers? Would you like to unmute your microphone and put your question to Councillor Raphael? Hello, Mr Beavers. Good evening. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. We can uh, hear you. You can hear me okay, yeah? Thank you. Will the relevant portfolio holder respond to and refer to committee this request for the mapping and delivery of urban and rural nature recovery networks as per the NPPF to include the creation and safeguarding of green spaces and corridors for species mobility and solutions to overcoming obstacles to migration and dispersal caused by the built environment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Raphael, would you like to respond? Madam Mayor, can I through you thank Mr Beavers for his question and of course thank him for all the work he does to safeguard and protect our natural environment. Uh, this is a pertinent question uh, and it will be the subject of discussion at committee when the green infrastructure strategy uh, goes before the EPH committee in January uh, next year for its annual appraisal. And members of the committee will remember that I insisted that there is an annual update so that uh, the, the green infrastructure strategy itself remains live and relevant. The government are currently discussing, as I understand it, an environment bill. And if it is, becomes law, the council will be obliged to deliver uh, on, on a number of the things that have been mentioned. Uh, and as a consequence, those things will naturally therefore become part of our policies. Uh, and so they will end up before the committee, including, of course, the mapping and delivery of, of um, recovery networks. Uh, I would like to say that uh, we we are some way along that uh, road already uh, with uh, the work that goes into uh, supporting the uh, uh, sinks, the biodiversity priority areas, the single biodiversity improvement zone that exists at the moment. Uh, there are ecological network maps. 
all of which fall under the umbrella of the green infrastructure strategies. Uh, and uh, um, I would say that the work that they do uh, is essential uh, and ongoing and cannot be overstated. I think it's very important. So um, I thank him for his question. It's timely, uh, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll hear more from him at committee in January. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Beavis, do you have a supplementary question you'd like to ask or do you want to move yes, on? Yes, please. Just briefly, it still concerns me that even under the MPPF, we can actually produce networks and we're not actually seeing networks. So my question is, will we get networks? Councillor Raphael, networks. I strongly suspect that that is going to be addressed in the green infrastructure strategy and through the bill that comes before Parliament. So if it is, we'll definitely be getting them. If it isn't, we look forward to hearing from Mr. Beavers at that meeting uh, to emphasise their importance to us. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the next question now. Can I invite um, Gillian Brown to ask your question, please? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, will the relevant portfolio holder respond to and refer to committee this request to schedule with communities and stakeholders extensive habitat restoration to a consistently high standard to deliver biodiversity net gain? Thank you, Councillor Raphael. Madam Mayor, can I thank uh, Ms Brown for her question through you? And... Uh, say that, uh, that of course again it's another timely question um, it is posed in a in a um, neutral manner so I'm not taking offense at it if I say that um, yes of course there is always more that can be done uh, but we have been doing a lot already uh, and can I just remind the council that in 2019 uh, our approach to protecting and enhancing the natural environment in the borough was recognized by the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, the CIEEM, in their annual awards. And we were one of only three councils to be shortlisted for the Planning Authority of the Year and the only district or borough on the shortlist. Um, we gained a highly commended award, praising our work with conservation groups, local communities and parishes, the development and delivery of policies and strategies relating to the natural environment, planning advice and biodiversity management. But as I say, that is that is then and we are now and it is an ongoing process uh, and we should not rest. Uh, we are in the process of developing um, a, a policy for 10 percent biodiversity net gain as part of the uh, planning applications, uh, which will respond to the requirements of the emerging environment bill um, and will eventually become policy as part of the local plan update. And of course, we will need to engage with members and the public um, in, in uh, that process. Um, and so all of that will go before committee in due course. It certainly will reach committee with the uh, review of the green infrastructure strategy in January. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that if um, Ms. Brown wishes, Madam Mayor, to draw any particular uh, habitats that need restoring to a consistently high standard, to our attention, I would be happy to engage with her through officers um, to see where those improvements can be made. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown, do you have a, a quick supplementary you'd like to ask? I do, thank you, and thank you for your response. Um, could you give us some timescales on when we might see an actual biodiversity plan? Well, Madam Mayor, I, can I answer this in this way? Uh, all that we do, it may be we're talking at cross purposes, but all that we do at the council falls under the local plan. And from the local plan, the green infrastructure strategy runs. And then from what else falls under the green infrastructure strategy are various policies, including obviously um, SPDs fall under that for the natural environment <coughs> um, uh, and these other policies that we've got to develop in terms of uh, biodiversity net gain will follow from what Parliament has decided, which has, as I understand, it, hasn't yet decided um, on that. So if I'm talking about the same thing as the questioner, um, it, it will come. 
but I can't give a time scale because we are somewhat dependent on Parliament and we're also somewhat dependent on um, other business of this council. But clearly it will come uh, and uh, it will fall under the green infrastructure strategy, which, as I say, is un in the local plan so that it has planning weight for planning decisions. I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, please can the questioner write to the officers and me and uh, um, we'll give more clarity if um, it's needed. But otherwise, I invite the questioner to address the committee in January. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, could I invite Mr. Beavers to come back to give his second question, please? Mr. Beavers. Uh, thank you, Councillor Taylor. Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Uh, again, will the relevant portfolio holder respond to and refer to committee this request to propose new measures for encouraging, incentivizing, empowering, and rewarding communities to have oversight and influence over green space services and learning opportunities and meaningful volunteer participation in service delivery. Thank you. M Madam Mayor, can I again thank uh, Mr. Beavers for his question? And again, it is a timely question because uh, he, he knows, because he's participated with me, uh, in trying to resolve a number of difficulties that have arisen uh, between uh, health and safety legislation and our wonderful volunteers who just want to get on and carry on looking after the natural environment. And the, they have conflicted where, of course, uh, they are working on council-owned land and the liability for something getting chopped off them immediately lies with the landowner, namely the council, regardless of... Um, uh, of what uh, the, the particular person was doing. So uh, the consequence of that have caused some difficulty and I have met with the volunteer groups uh, to try and resolve this. And I, I think at the current moment it is resolved, but there is an outstanding invitation, open invitation from me to them to meet again, to ensure that it is working going forwards because yeah, it's, a, it's a tricky balance to have um, but we think we've reached a compromise that allows the volunteers to get on with the majority of their work um, without being constrained and shackled by the health and safety re legislation or litig litigious um, people who may decide that the council is a good touch. Um, so um, I, this is an ongoing process. Um, and of course, we, in my view, um, the natural environment is best protected by the people of this borough. It's the role of the council is to encourage and advise and support and obviously to deal with policy when it comes into the planning process. But ultimately, it's the people of this uh, borough who protect the natural environment best. And uh, of course, the council as an enabler must support them in that. Thank you very much. Um, is that OK, Mr. Beavers? Do you want to ask anything I'd else like on that? I'd like to ask a supplementary quickly. Yes, go ahead. Would the portfolio holder agree then that the role of community and how it might be strengthened is a subject that full council might consider debating given a slow response to climate change, ecological breakdown and the pandemic? Well, the answer to that question is is going to be yes, in the sense of because these are all relevant topics and councillors across the board will find them all relevant. I suspect, though, um, and I hope that um, if anyone was to propose a motion in, in due course, they would perhaps chop that up a bit and refer to one of those topics but rather than all of them, because uh, otherwise um, it, it's a very broad uh um, uh, arena and uh, subjects to address. But I, I, uh, it's absolutely right. These are important matters for us to discuss and we will continue to discuss them as, as a council, whether in committee or at full council going forwards. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Beavers. Um, I think we're going to hear from you one more time. But next, um, we have Mr. Rowan Hardin. Harding. Would you like to ask Councillor Fell your question, please? Uh, hello, I'm sorry, I'm not a mister. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Miss <laughs> <laughs> <Ms>. Harding. No <laughs> Thank you. Many apologies. That's all right. I just thought I'd give you a surprise. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. So the question is just would the portfolio holder agree that all ages, but especially children, 
um, need access to and investment in outdoor nature learning um, that the borough really has a role in making sure that this happens as well. Thank you, Councillor Raphael. Can you unmute your microphone, Councillor? Well, yes, of course I do most, uh, most definitely agree with that question. And uh, that's why uh, in my own ward, I supported uh, a, uh, an, well, I've forgotten what you call a woodland school, that's what it was called, uh, which had been buffeted around the borough um, and uh, got, a, got approval. In fact, uh, I took it to committee to ensure it went on along, was supported by a number of uh, people from uh, uh, various groups and calling, of course, Mr. Beavers as a local resident was supporting it too, um, against, of course, our own officers who didn't want it to take place, um, which was quite unfortunate. So uh, yes, and can I say this, that uh, uh, we, uh, with the Biodiversity Improvement Zone in Hatch Warren, were aiming to uh, very actively engage with the children in the schools there, following up the work that had been done with the local volunteers in that area. Uh, but of course, the virus has put a, a stop on that at the current moment, but we will continue to do that uh, in due course. And of course, whilst the primary um, uh, um, the guardians of education are the education authority and the teachers, and it's not for us to dictate to them, uh, but we, of course, do work closely with them. And there are a number of things that the borough gets involved with, with bio blitz events, Rivers Week, Annual Love Parks Week. And then there was a, a campaign quite recently about watering trees, which uh, engaged quite a number of children across the borough. Uh, all of these things are important. And uh, I'm also re recognise the value that uh, much of what we're seeking to do is changing attitudes or, or partly educational. And if uh, children understand the importance of things, they go back and tell their parents that it, it is important that we allow the wildflowers to grow um, uh, uh, in some of the open spaces, uh, rather than uh, constantly trying to tell parents that that's what should go on directly from the council and then and then perhaps taking a contrary view. So. Uh, yes, th this is a very important question and I agree uh, with what's being suggested. Thank you very much. Ms Harding, do you have an, a supplementary to ask or is that okay? No, I don't. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, answer. It was very thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I now welcome Mr Steve Goodwin? Please, would you ask your question? <coughs> Will the council rebalance investment to focus more on restoring infrastructure for biodiversity as opposed to hard landscaping type projects. Councillor Raphael. Oops. On mute. Are you speaking, Councillor Raphael? Could you switch on your microphone? Sorry, there was the technology and also the fact I was slightly, I noticed there was a distinction between the written question and the oral one. And I was just yeah. obviously need to answer the question, which however it is phrased. Uh, the, I think it's important for us to, to recognize, and I know there is a, there's a slight disagreement amongst those who are uh, passionate about what we should do with the natural environment. I think there's a disagreement between how we cost this. And I'm not a fan of trying to suggest that um, uh, that, that, that there should be a, a number in the budget that rivals the, the amount of money we spend on waste collection or the amount of money that we spend on dealing with homelessness. It, it, it's my view that uh, this, it, that's comparing chalk and cheese. Uh, and what we need to do is work out uh, what the state of the natural environment should be and how we're going to get there and the costs will follow accordingly. And in a sense, it's my view that um, every resident ought to be a participant in improving the natural environment. We as councillors all agree with that. I, I hope that, that 
all our residents agree with that. Um, they may not, but uh, I believe that they should be participants in that. And of course, that is again a distinction between um, other things the council does, because there are other things the council does that residents can't do, like bin collection, for instance. And so consequently, um, putting a financial uh, ticket on it when so much of it is done by people um, uh, outside of the, 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 the as far as offices is difficult to do. Uh, but in terms of the expenditure we do have, of course, <laughs> the everything we're doing through the climate emergency declaration, everything we're trying to do to protect our open spaces, everything we're trying to do to link up East Rock Park, Wall Memorial Park, Blackdown Ponds, Crab Tree, the Lime Bits, Basing Fen. Uh, on the Easter basis though, everything we're trying to do to promote the country park and get it open as soon as possible, everything we're trying to do to promote the green corridors that link Beggarwood Park, uh, Old Down, have green uh, corridor that goes through the southern part of Many Down out into the wilds of Oakley, um, all of that, just to take those examples, there are obviously others in the borough, um, are, they have a financial cost, but we are funding them and we're continuing to fund them uh, and um, I think that as uh, people appreciate the value, then I think people will see a shift in our budget um, towards uh, increased expenditure proportionately, not necessarily overall at the headline because of uh, constraints, but in proportionately uh, towards supporting the natural environment. And, the, and, and when we've had COVID, we, we've realised that people enjoyed through the lockdown period uh, the natural environment that is in parts of the borough that it may not necessarily have gone to uh, before, especially areas south of the motorway for the residents of Black, uh, Brighton Hill and uh, Kempshot um, in the beautiful countryside around Clidderston, uh, realise that that is a cherished area that needs to be protected. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Goodwin, do you have a supplementary to ask? No. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The reason I said good is that we're getting a little bit towards the end of the time allocated for questions, but I do want to hear the last two. Um, so, Mr. Beavers, can you put your last question, please, to Councillor Raphael? It's the last question, actually, Councillor Taylor. Um, will the relevant portfolio holder respond to and refer to committee this request to review local plan? policy monitoring criteria reported in the AMR to resolve discrepancies or ambiguities and recommend improvements. Thank you. I'll take it shortly so we get to the last question and the answer. Uh, yes, it's published in December. Yes, it's discussed at committee in January. Yes, if there are things that should be included from it, we look forward to hearing to, from the questioner and others uh, what improvements can be made and they can be discussed at committee in January. Excellent, thank you very much. Is that okay, Mr. Beavers? We do actually, I think, have one more questioner. It, it, do you want no, to ask no, anything else? No, no, the last, this is the last question. Uh, just one final thing that I would like to get across. Um, when the AMR and other reports make reference to the natural environment, it tends to be so generalistic as to be um, unrecognisable as a description. And I would ask that we get descriptions that give a realistic picture of the state of nature, which we do not currently get in council reports. Thank you. Well, the answer is to that, uh, of course, any constructive improvements that make things work better, must we must respond to. So I look forward to hearing from Mr. Beavers in due course, but there is a question from Ms. Tuck, Mrs. Tuck, I understand. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Beavers. It's always good to hear from you. Um, yes, I believe we have uh, Kate Tuck, who also wants to ask a question of Councillor Raphael. Ms. Tuck, are you there? Yes. Yes, please. Our Helen Mayor, Councillor's Officers, good evening. Um, I understand from angling groups and the Environment Agency that the water quality of the River Loddon in 2019 was poor, poor fail. That's poor for overall water body poor for ecological and fail for chemical. In 2016, that was moderate, moderate good for the same categories. So we've gone, gone down quite some way. Could the council assure me uh, that adhering to EM6 in our local plan and UK legislation remains paramount? And as such, advise me what new measures um, you're going to take to manage, protect and improve the River Loddon? 
Madam Mayor, can I thank Mrs Tuck for her question, which of course is timely, uh, the, uh, and I'll take it uh, at pace, and it's a slightly technical answer. Uh, she is absolutely right. The newly published classifications indicate that in 2019 uh, that uh, the river is failing in, in all, all respects. Uh, and uh, this, of course, uh, is, is something that's occurred across the, the whole of England, as I understand it, with in relation to ri rivers. Two sections of the Loddon failed the chemical status due to priority hazardous substances. And the Loddon in the Sherfield of Loddon to Swallowfield section failed due to um, some very long, complicated chemical names. Um, the overall ecological classification of the, the Loddon uh, from Basingstoke to the River Lyde at Hartley Westpool has also deteriorated from moderate to poor in the last three year, years due to corresponding deterioration in its biological quality, such as fish, although it's noted that there's been some improvement in the physico-chemical quality from moderate to good. So due to a corresponding improvement, um, apparently in dissolved oxygen, the overall ecological classification, the other two sex allotments remains the same as 2016 as moderate. Um, the policies in our local plan are designed to prevent further development, uh, which exacerbates or deteriorates um, the, the, the quality of the river. In the light of these changes, uh, we have written at my uh, direction uh, to the Environment Agency and we are waiting a response. And I just want to emphasise, don't think we are just going to sit back and wait. We are determined to get a response and to take whatever effort it can be um, if it means writing to the Secretary of State to tell the Environment Agency to give us a response, we will do so. Um, we work in partnership with others, of course, and we're not directly responsible for water quality. But of course, uh, Mrs Tuck will know, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, that uh, we care, and I certainly personally care, uh, uh, very much for the quality of the River Loddon and for the quality of the water that flows through the Basing Fen. Uh, and that is why I have set up uh, the East of Basingstoke Natural Environment Management Plan, which will seek to ensure that the water quality and the wildlife in that area um, is managed uh, uh, with oversight by the council, even though it may only be a partner in all of this, and that water quality will improve in due course. So um, I thank her for her question. It's work in progress and uh, I hope to be able to update her in due course. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, very good response. Um, is that okay, Mrs Tuck, do you want to ask a supplementary? Uh, thank you, that was incredibly helpful, um, Councillor Raphael, um, and I look forward to hearing your answers. Uh, is it something that would be worth taking to the EPH Scrutiny Committee as a, as a special agenda item? Uh, Madam Mayor, the water cycle study and various things to do with the water study uh, will have to be before EPH when it considers the local plan update. And of course, if... Uh, the current uh, situation remains as an inhibitor to growth and, and it, depending on the answer from the Environment Agency that will be the subject of discussion by the EPH committee. So in a sense the answer will be debated uh, at EPH because I know I and its members will want to know the answer before we progress the local plan update. So that's a long-winded way of saying I think the answer is yes but perhaps not in the straightforward format that she may be asking the question in. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the questioners and thank you, Mark, uh, Councillor Raphael. You can have a little break now. Relax for a while, only a short while. Um, now, we have no petitions, so we'll move on to item seven, resignations and appointments. Um, first of all, the committees. Are there any proposed changes? Yes, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have three reserves I would like to appoint to development control. Um, Mark Taylor, Ruth Cooper and Angie Freeman. Um, I would also like to uh, promote Angie to full membership of the Many Down Overview Committee and have Ruth as a reserve. Um, and I would also like to nominate Carolyn Waldridge as a reserve on the HR committee. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm sure officers will have noted that. Um, any other group leaders have any other proposed changes to the committees? No. 
Okay, thank you. Um, outside bodies, which you can find on page 29. Um, can you raise your hand if you wish to propose someone for either of the two current vacancies, which are Basingstoke Music Festival Committee and Carla the Arts? No. Nope. Okay, just on the subject of raising hands, um, one or two of you might not have virtual hands, so I apologize. I will, uh, if you wave your arm vigorously enough, one of the officers or I will notice you if you wish to say anything. But I think most people have got the virtual facility. Um, is there anybody who wishes now to resign from an outside body or are we all happy with what we've got now? Okay, thank you very much. We'll proceed to item eight, the first quarter revenue and monitoring report and COVID-19 financial impact update. So this is a recommendation from the cabinet meeting held on the 8th of September and can be found on pages 31 to 58 of the agenda book. Um, you'll see that there are eight items to note and three to approve as listed in the agenda. Uh, Councillor Hannah Golding, would you like to introduce this and propose it? And sorry, so, Madam Mayor, it's going I'd to like be... the oh, leader to propose it and I will second I'm it. So sorry. Right. It's Councillor normally Rattigan. me, we're just changing it up for fun. Thank you. Councillor Rattigan, over to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I... I I thank you for the change and I thank my cabinet member for her indulgence. Um, this monitoring report, uh, I hate to say, does not make uh, great reading for us as a, as a borough. And um, there are things for you to note, things for you to approve, but genuinely it is a worrying situation on our revenue report as outlined. But before uh, I move on to some of the substance. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank my fellow group leaders, Councillor Ian Tilbury, Councillor Andy McCormack, and Councillor Gavin James, who have been amazingly supportive of the situation here as a, a council, as our revenue has fallen, um, and they have they have understood the situation is grave, but is also a national issue. Uh, and this local context of what we have in front of us today has been well understood by them, but also scrutinised. So I would just like to express my thanks to you, Madam Mayor, for the fact that we as councillors of whatever political colour could come together at a distressing time for our borough and for our finances in, in a sense of collaboration to understand, but also to, to find ways forward to uh, make sure that some of the, the problems that we have in terms of financing are at least, at least mitigated in some way, shape or form. Uh, firstly, uh, the COVID implications, the current estimated cost are 5.98 million pounds. This um, more than dwarfs the amount of funding, funding that we have had from the government of 2.13 million uh, as detailed in section six of the report. It is, it is deeply distressing that our residents will have a hole in their income to the borough council that we cannot fill. But I assure you both via the administration uh, and our officers that we will lobby government to make sure that as much of that additional burden is put back to central government for some of the things that we have had to had to deal with. And I, I assure you that we will ensure that all revenue streams will be looked at to ensure that, that we have the money uh, possible to, to finance all of the ambitious plans of us as a borough. So I ask you to note from one to eight, um, then moving to the cabinet, we will approve the MTFS uh, in terms of our review, but also uh, Cabinet requests you as our council to approve 10, 11 and 12. Uh, some of those items are for the most vulnerable in our um, borough, those who are rough sleepers and our homelessness revenue. I hope that you can support all of these things as laid out here uh, and I hope that uh, as you read them and as my cabinet member for finance runs through them, you will ask her any questions that may arise. But thank you for your time and your patience on this. Thank you very much, Councillor Rattigan. Uh, Councillor Golding, do you want to speak now? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. 
Um, the report before you this evening presents the revenue forecast position for the current financial year as at June 2020. As the leader has already outlined, it has been an unprecedented year with significant challenges across the council, both in terms of having to deliver additional support services, but also in having to adapt so very quickly to a significant change in income. Therefore, this report also outlines the funding position from the impact of COVID-19 so far and asks council to note the proposed rebasing of the current year's budget and to approve the revised version. COVID continues to have a huge impact on our finances and the most significant part of that is forecast to be in this financial year, but obviously this could still change as the pandemic progresses. As the leader has outlined, the current estimated full year costs from COVID-19 are £5.98 million, which is a huge sum of money. It includes both £1.04 million of additional costs and also £4.94 million of reduced income. Table 1 on page 36 outlines for you the national funding allocation to the borough, which was to help mit us mitigate the financial impact of COVID-19. While welcome, the £2.13 million allocated to the council directly does not compensate for our loss of income. And that loss can range, has ranged from a reduction in planning income, reduced use of our council car parks, as well as smaller interest rates, to mention just a few. Further support from the government is being expected and may compensate us for around 75 pence of every one pound we've lost, but this is not yet confirmed. Um, however, Council will be updated on the progress of this in future quarterly updates. Given the limited amount of funds received from um, national government, there remained a significant budget gap. And in order to mitigate this shortfall, the budget has been reviewed line by line with officers who are also undergoing the challenge of having to um, deliver new services. Um, tighter controls of spending have been introduced, including a recruitment freeze and delaying some of our executive commitments. The transformation project work was also had to be brought forward suddenly to, in order to support effective working from home. This However, all these steps that officers have taken behind the scenes, alongside our historic strong management of our finances, has put the council in a relatively strong position to continue dealing with the financial impact of COVID-19, and it really should not be taken for granted. Alongside working on our internal finances, officers have been working incredibly hard to support local businesses and residents, and this shouldn't be underestimated. The leader has already outlined um, some of these things, but I would like to take the time to repeat this point. Our officers were among the first to distribute the original business rate funding grant and also led the way across Hampshire with a scheme for um, the discretionary grant scheme. And I saw the difference this made to our local businesses. They got a lifeline so quickly in such a turbulent time and the compliments that the council re received about that were glowing. And this was not the same across the country. And therefore, I would like to thank Lucy Gallia and her team specifically for this great work. But back to our revenue budget. Colleagues, there will be more challenges ahead. We must continue to monitoring our spending very carefully and seek to make our planned savings. We must continue to lobby government for the financial support we need to continue to deliver the best for our residents. However, we should not underestimate the good work that officers have done to get us this far already, especially while also dealing with the extra work required by COVID. And therefore, I commend this report to full council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Golding. Uh, Councillor Gavin James, you wish to speak. Good evening, Mayor. Um, yes, I'd like to speak on this. I, I will endorse uh, what Councillor Rattigan has said. I mean, I absolutely appreciate the council are in a difficult position, and I'm sure he has the support of all group leaders as he tries to get government to fill some of the financial void that we are facing. But uh, it's unlikely to all be filled, and I think it's really important that we as a council also take some responsibility. Reading through this document in some detail, um, I, I noticed that we are looking to uh, we've got an adverse £290,000 to sports and recreation facilities. Now, these are run, I think it's more, essentially the Tadley Pool, which is run by Serco, uh, nice local business. Um, they uh, are claiming money from us because the pool was closed, which I understand. 
I'm sure their staff were furloughed, funded by the government, uh, and I'm sure there was cost savings involved. When we have contractors, there's an element of risk. You take over a contract, you hopefully will make a small amount of profit. You may end up in a pandemic situation doing a lot worse. That's what's happened here. My concern is we are looking to plug the fact they've made a loss. If next year the people of Tadley don't go on holiday and decide to use local leisure facilities and Serco make an awful lot of money as people are scared to travel, do we think Serco are going to ring us up and say, I'm sorry, Councillor Rattigan, we've made far too much, much money this year. We're going to give you some back. It's not going to happen. So we're bailing out Serco. Equally, we've had a, an interruption to our bin collection service this year where we've not had the service that we are they are contracted to deliver. Uh, our bin service is run by the very same Serco. Uh, now, there are reasons why they couldn't deliver that service, which I totally accept, but it doesn't seem to be anywhere in here that we're saying to them, look, you didn't deliver the service, so uh, you'll have to refund us because we're saying to Serco, we appreciate there's problems, that's okay. So well done to Serco. And this is the same Serco whose executive in August announced uh, that they'd done very well out of COVID and managed to cover all my, uh, their new uh, sort of counter COVID contracts had covered all their losses from other um, schemes that have been impacted by COVID. So they've come out of this pretty much neutral, uh, very busy tracking and tracing very ineffectively as we speak. Uh, so COVID, so Serco have done okay. Uh, we've done, we've struggled, and now we're going to help Co um, Serco out a bit more. It all seems a little bit strange. So I would like to hope, Madam Mayor, that when we get to the point of voting, um, I think Councillor Rattigan saying we're voting on 10, 11 and 12, uh, there isn't a 12. Uh, I think you meant 9, 10 and 11. I, I would like to think we could vote on those individually, because certainly I absolutely endorse number 10. Uh, the homeless, uh, the work done on the homeless during the, the pandemic has been absolutely incredible. The success of it has been amazing. And clearly there's more work to do to cement that as the hotels that we use to help during the pandemic reopen as hotels. We've got to keep that work going. I have no issue with number 11, absolutely appropriate uh, use of funding. Uh, but number nine, I'm getting more and more worried about. Are we being an easy touch? Are we being too soft on private sector? It's right to support local businesses. I'm not sure it's right to bend over backwards and get the taxpayer to fund Serco's problems. Um, I think we need to explore that more deeply, certainly in future monitoring reports. So if we're going to vote on one uh, as one block, I will support it, despite number nine and the weakness we are showing as a council. Uh, but I'd be like to take the vote on each three individually. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Um, I, I, uh, 12, I, the 12 to vote on is on page 33. It's the additional spend for new funding requests uh, to be funded from the MTMF, MTFS risk reserve. Um, so I don't know if you want to look at that on page 33 as well. So um, you're suggesting that um, we obviously note the first eight, but then you want to vote on the individual um, items that we are expected to approve, is that right? Okay. Madam Mayor, can I, Madam Mayor, can I interrupt? Yes, Councillor Rattigan. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, item nine is for the cabinet to approve, not for council, and therefore all, all council is to approve tonight is 10, 11 and 12, as outlined by myself. Um, although I accept uh, Councillor James's point that we should scrutinise um, should we be funding uh, monies to circle in terms of the, the leisure facilities. Uh, tonight's vote is only on the three elements as outlined by myself at the, the proposal um, earlier. Point of order, a uh, point of personal clarification, if you like, Madam Mayor. Okay. I'm, I'm reading the council agenda, 15th of October 2020. Uh, number eight, quarter one, revenue monitoring report. Numbers one to eight, council note. Nine, 10 and 11, council approve. That's what it says in the agenda. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gavin James. Um, I, the, the printed document in front of me uh, does, not that, does not say that. Page 32 and 33 uh, on the hard copy. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're looking at it electronically, but that's how I see it. Can I ask clarification from Madam Mayor? If I can just say point of clarification on that, I understand there is a difference in numbering between the agenda that's published online and the paper pack, which Councillor Vox pointed out to me. 
So I shouldn't take credit for that, but I think that's where the confusion is. Yes, so I, I understand now I've taken advice that the correct version will be found in your agenda book, not on the update sheet. So if you look at pages 32 and 33 in your agenda book, I understand that that is the definitive version and we will be voting on items 10, 11 and 12 on those two pages for approval. Okay, does everybody got that? Thank you. Can I invite Councillor Gary Watts to speak, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's as reported before by everybody else, no doubt COVID has had a massive impact on our budget. Uh, it's very, we're in a very precarious position and it's very difficult times and we're very likely to take a, a never hit on our budget. But we have a, a shortfall at the moment of 2.17 million for this financial year. Um, and I don't see very much mitigation for that. And if we're not gonna get the government to, to bail the council councils out, this council out, plus all the other councils, how are we gonna actually recruit that money but saying that, I mean, at, right at the beginning of the meeting, the, the leader of the council was praising all the activities this council did when COVID came in March. And I would endorse that. The feedback I had from people that was isolating and the voluntary sector, we were slow to start off, but then we, we kicked into gear. And they were very complimentary about the county as well. So, you know, give credit when it's due. I think the council did react well. I have a, a few concerns in the uh, report. It says that we lost uh, just over a million pound in uncertainties to planning. So this report was on the 30th of June. Uh, since then, DC has had multiple meetings. It, I believe it met every week in July uh, and it is doing a lot of uh, catching up. We've had some major planning applications uh, gone through in that period of time. We had the golf club, uh, over a thousand homes. We had many down and several ever major planning applications. So that money isn't lost. It's, it's just delayed. So I think that's a bit, uh, that needs a uh, revising. Yes, I, I take the, the money for the car parking is lost and we're not going to get that back. 1.67 million is an awful big hit for a council of our size. And another aspect I, I'm concerned about, I mean, the government right back in the beginning of this, they rushed into spending lots of money. Some of it was very well targeted. Some of it wasn't. And a lot of it's been subjected to fraud. I mean, I read a report last week from the National Audit Office about the bounce back loans, that 60% of those loans will not be paid back, costing the taxpayer 26 billion pounds. And there was a report the previous month about the furlough scheme, where fraud, again, is costing the taxpayer 3 billion pounds. I just wonder what safeguarding audit checks the council is going to do or has been doing to make sure our money has been going to the right organisations and, and the worthy, and we haven't been subjected to fraud. So I would like to know what, what we are doing about that. And as I said right at the beginning, I'd just like to see a bit more detail of what we're actually going to do to mitigate the losses. And again, we're going to take a financial hit again because you know all the signals out there aren't very good. Uh, but overall, um, I, I support the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Paul Franken. Sorry, just to mute myself. Can I just have clarification from legal? It's on page 32, is cabinet is recommended to approve, not resolved, it's recommended to be approved. If it's, if it, is it worded wrong? Because if it's cabinet's decision, it should say resolved. So can the legal please check that one? Can we have the words changed? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I understand it's already been to cabinet. So it's already, so it, it, I think it's a, the wording needs to be amended in it, but it's, it's already agreed by cabinet. 
So, so the wording in the paper should say resolved by cabinet. Sorry, I'm just checking. Yes, I, I think I, it might be that the report was written for both. Um, so it had the wording for both cabinet and council. So it's not been amended, you know, since it went to cabinet. So cabinet agreed recommendation nine. Right, so we will change that for the minute. Yeah. So I take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for picking that up, Councillor Harvey. Um, Franklin. Uh, sorry, Councillor Franklin. Why did I say Harvey? I must be looking at him. Um, okay, so I think that's all the speakers I've got. And I'd just like to clarify something now with Councillor Harvey. Oh, that's, I know, that's why it's because Councillor Harvey had his hand up. Over to you, Councillor Harvey. It helps if you press the right button. Sorry, thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Raise your hand, lower your hand, press the mic on off. I'm getting the, yeah, I'll get myself going in a minute with this one. Um, can I thank the officers for the report and the cabinet members for bringing the report this evening? Um, knowing how much work must have gone into managing this situation is, in no uncertain terms, uh, absolutely amazing. And I we totally endorsed the leader's comments earlier uh, in terms of what the community have done, what our officers have done. But in terms of this report particularly, the way that our officers are managing the finances, because it is no tall order. Um, I think the government do have a responsibility here to support local government. I think they should be doing far more than they are doing. Uh, and I think that needs to be recognised. And I know that leaders, not just yourself, Councillor Rattigan, but across the board, are representing local government in that regard, because our officers are actually on the front line of quite a lot of this. And it's our officers out in the community that are dealing with a lot of the very complex issues that COVID has presented for, for many of the most vulnerable, but also quite a significant proportion of our community. Um, I think that's important, so we shouldn't minimise the impact of that in any way. I have a tremendous amount of sympathy with Councillor James's point about Serco. And if we were able to separate that out from this particular report, if we could pick out that line and say, actually, no, on that one, we don't support it, I would feel far more comfortable uh, about this whole report. And I'm conscious of just how much is in here and whether or not that would even be, even be possible. Um, but I do think it's worth highlighting, as Councillor James has done, that it is particularly rich from Serco to be doing that to us as a borough, given the circumstances that many of our residents have faced. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very point very well made. Uh, and could I also say in terms of the freeze, the, the vacancy freeze that the Cabinet member referred to, um, I totally understand that, but I would just like to underline, I think, the importance of filling the vacancies we have of the borough in frontline services, particularly our ops teams and those frontline units that the that you know, the community do see day in day out, and how important it is that they're at full strength, so that we deliver the quality of service that our residents need, because you know COVID had has an impact on the environment in which we live, because our teams have not been able to be out there doing the work we wanted them to be doing. They are now out there, and I'd love to see them at full strength without having to employ agency staff in their place but actually giving jobs to local residents, good jobs to local residents to, to, to support our communities through those teams. So if we could, if it's not a complete recruitment freeze, but at least we are absolutely sure the vacancies to the frontline teams are being filled, I think that's really, really important. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Tilbury. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, just on the Serco point, as you expect, you probably wouldn't find me defending Serco at any point for anything they're pretty useless but I, I seem to recall at the time there was the service the reduction in service came about there was a, a, some ability in there to claw money back from them I mean it wasn't sort of specified how this would happen but I'm going back to sort of March time but unfortunately I can't access the documents because I can't use my other computer because the broadband's so rubbish down here but I mean perhaps the portfolio holder might have a better grasp of this after all it is her job but you know i think there is something in there that we can do because basically obviously for a long time they were only doing bi-weekly collection rather than weekly so obviously there is a reduced cost to them i know they had there's other issues and there's other other costs but there, i think there was something in the paperwork at the time when we sort of looked at this to agree that but perhaps if someone could clarify that thank you madam mayor Thank you very much. Uh, so um, uh, over to Han Councillor Hannah Golding. Um, 
if you could just clarify if we can do anything to address the concerns expressed about Serco at this stage. Um, absolutely. So I'd like to clarify, it is a provision. So Serco have approached the council, but we are in negotiations with them about this. So it's not, um, it's not a done deal. Um, and it's not um, a particularly easy conversation that we are having with them. We are putting a lot of pressure and a lot of our expectations on them, um, particularly with the sports and leisure side of things. I'd also like to reassure Councillor Harvey um, that it hasn't been a full recruitment freeze. Um, so posts have been evaluated on their individual basis where we can freeze and can delay recruitment. We have in order to spend money, but obviously where services are completely um, critical to residents and we wouldn't be able to deliver, um, including in the finance portfolio, you may have noticed, because <laughs> I do have a budget to, to put forward to you all soon. Um, we, we have made, um, we've kind of made very sensible decisions, but the expectation is that we've been able to re um, freeze recruitment wherever is sensible and possible. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Simon Bound. I just wanted to pick up the point uh, that Councillor James made about the ledger contract, Madam Mayor, uh, and I've been looking for the figure, so excuse me if it's not exactly right, but uh, and when I had the portfolio for leisure with Serco, we came up with the new contract with them, which on an ordinary year gave us a net contribution to us, which I seem to remember was between 340 and £360,000. This year, um, the provision that we're talking about and the discussions that we're having are in the order of 290 the other way. So the net, the net differences in some respects in, in good years still means that we benefit. So I just wanted to put that out there as far as how the overall length and term of the contract will mean as far as contributions coming to us. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to um, sum up in any way, Councillor Rattigan, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just very briefly to, to remind councillors how well they looked after us in previous years. The fact that you set aside reserves so as we have money to rely on in the future um, has been done over a number of years. And that financial probity will help us in bad years, perhaps next year and ongoing if this COVID crisis continues. So I am I want to thank you for that. We um, have a great team and the point about fraud and bounce back loans doesn't really sit with us. You need to know that our finance team before they handed out any grants, did all the checkings, made sure that people uh, had their businesses within the borough, who were residents of the borough, were people who had a business for an extended period of time. That was the way we ensured that every grant went to the right person at the right time. Yes, sometimes it took a little bit longer because residents were not used to applying for grants because their businesses had gone well for many years. But rest assured, it is my belief that nothing and no grants were paid to people who were fraudulent or we could look back on and say that was a mistake. So. I recommend it, the whole report to you, and I recommend that Council approve 10, 11 and 12 as outlined uh, in your Cabinet papers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't have any more speakers, but I do just need to now really settle exactly where we've got to with this one. Um, Councillor Golding has said that the Serco funding isn't actually confirmed, and it says at paragraph 6.13 that it's been requested but we haven't presumably had a decision. Um, and obviously the concerns that have been expressed by several councillors um, tonight will be noted. I'm sure of that. Um, but I just need to make sure um, with Councillor Gavin James that the three items that we have to approve aren't related in any way to Serco, as you know. They are um, the revised budget on table five. They're the additional spend for rough sleepers and they're the additional spend for new funding requests relating to Junction 7 and the devolution and local government reorganisation. Um, so if I could check, therefore, if you have no dissent anywhere for any of those, um, which is what we'll be voting on, 
could you could you raise your hand if you have and we will go to a formal vote right. okay Councillor Madam Mayor, point, point of clarification yeah. um obviously the circo element is part of the budget you approve a budget where we are allocating funds uh, potentially we're allocating them whether we're going to use them is down to negotiation then that's clearly part of the budget i think there's two things we need to clarify firstly are we voting on 10 11 and 12 on the cabinet papers or are we voting on 9 10 and 11 in the council agenda because item 9 on page 6 uh, no, that's a capital one sorry item uh, 9 on page 5 in the council agenda relates to number 10 on the cabinet papers on page 32. So I could say I'm happy to support 10, but I'm only happy to support 10 on this one, not 10 on that one, which is exactly the same thing. It's a bit bizarre. The numbering has gone all kind of wrong. So are we using the council agenda? Are we using the cabinet agenda? And then I would like to, I'm, I'm happy that we can probably all agree as a council, uh, depending what numbers, that the last two, whatever they are, uh, are all completely acceptable. But, but I would like to record um, my abstention or opposition, or I'll go with abstention on element uh, nine or 10, depending what agenda you're using right now. Thank you. Okay, for clarification, the definitive um, agenda report that we're using is the one that's in the cabinet, in the agenda book, not in the update paper. So, Madam Mayor, you... Madam Mayor the, the one I am using is in the council agenda. The, the book here with council agenda written on it, yeah. yes, very clearly, if you open it up and you go through the agenda of this council meeting and you look at this particular topic, item eight, quarter one revenue monitoring report, there is number nine, there is number 10, there is number 11, there is no number 12. When you turn to page 32, the cabinet agenda, you will see that number nine has become number 10 because number nine, which was approved by cabinet has disappeared. Number 10 becomes 11, number 11 becomes 12. I am using the council agenda because we are at a council meeting. I'm not using the cabinet papers, which was for the cabinet agenda. So you need to clarify which one we're using, but I'm not using any sort of mad document here. I'm using the same book that we were issued Okay, thank you very much. Just give me one moment and I will clarify it again for you. Just a moment. Point of order, Madam Mayor. While I believe that Councillor James is right in what he's saying, I'm not entirely sure the patronisation was necessary. I'd just like that put on record. Point of personal clarification. It was not patronising, it was explaining, because I have tried to explain several times this evening and no one seemed to understand. So I was explaining it more clearly to assist with the full running of this council in a, in a, in a very efficient manner. Thank you very much. The explanation has been received and understood. Just one moment. Okay, we have a solution. Um, the points that we are to approve are exactly the same. The only difference is the numbering. So let's go back to, therefore, thank you, Councillor James, um, the council agenda that council approved nine, which is the revised budget, 10, which is the additional spend for rough sleeping, and 11, which is the additional spend for Junction 7 and devolution and local government reorganisation. And we will call them 9, 10 and 11 as on the paper, on the um, council papers. Now, do I understand, Councillor James, that you are happy with the second two, but not with the first one, in which case I'll, I'll take a vote separately? That's correct, Madam Mayor. Okay, in that case, we'll do a vote, please, first of all, on... I 
item nine, which is for the revised budget. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'll commence the roll call. Councillor Ashfield, for, against, or abstain? Abstain. Councillor Bean. For. Councillor Michael Bound. Abstain. Councillor Simon Bound. For. Councillor Capon. For. Councillor Carruthers. Councillor Carruthers? Four. Councillor Cooper is absent. Councillor Court? Four. Councillor Cousins? Abstain. Councillor Cubitt? Four. Councillor Eaches? Four. Councillor Edwards? Four. Councillor Faulkner? Four. Councillor Jane Frankham? Sorry. Four. Councillor Paul Frankham. Four. Councillor Freeman. Four. Councillor Frost. Four. Councillor Gardner. I'm sorry, Councillor Gardner's absent, I'm told. Sorry, Councillor Gaskell? Four. Councillor George? Four. Councillor Godison? Four. Councillor Golding? Four. Councillor Grant? Four. Councillor Harvey? <coughs> Abstain. Councillor Hickling? Abstain. Councillor Hussey? Abstain. Councillor Isaac. Four. Councillor Gavin James. Abstain. Councillor Laura James. Abstain. Councillor Kozinexi. Abstain. Councillor Kinnear. Four. Councillor Jones. Abstain. Councillor Keating. Sorry, he's absent. Councillor Leakes. Four. Councillor Lovegrove. Abstain. Councillor McCormick. Four. Councillor Mackay. Abstain. Councillor Mahaffey. Four. Councillor Miller. Four. Councillor Fillimore. Abstain. Councillor Potter. Abstain. Councillor Putty. Four. Councillor Regan. <laughs> Councillor Regan. Don't know if you're having difficulty mute unmuting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Councillor Regan? Yes, we can hear I you thought, now. I thought I'd vote it. Abstain, please. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Reid? Four. Councillor Rattigan? Four. 
Councillor Nicholas Robinson. Oh. Councillor Tristan Robinson. Four. Councillor Raphael. Four. Councillor Sanders. Four. Councillor Still, I think was absent. Yeah. Councillor Diane Taylor. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Kim Taylor. Four. Councillor Mark Taylor is absent. Councillor Tilbury. Four. Councillor Tomlin. Abstain. Councillor Vox. Four. Councillor Watts. Four. Councillor Janet Westbrook. Four. Councillor Michael Westbrook. Abstain. Councillor Wooldridge. I'm not participating due to the... Potential. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Sorry. Thanks. If you just bear with us and we'll get the results for you. Uh, Madam Mayor, that's um, 37 members in favour and 17 abstentions. Thank you very much. Um, therefore, the revised budget is approved and that has been carried. Uh, just moving on to the other two items that's um, for approval, that's 10 and 11, as on the council paper. Um, I, what I need to know is if we have any dissent on them, and they are for the additional spend for the Rough Sleeper Initiative and the additional spend for new funding requests relating to Junction 7 and the devolution and local government reorganisation. If there is no dissent, I will take it as approved. So can you raise your hand if you have a problem with either of those? Thank you very much. So there is nobody dissenting. I will therefore take it that those two elements have now been approved by council. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number nine, the first quarter capital monitoring report. This report can be found on pages 59 to 76. And the recommendation from the cabinet is to note eight parts of it and to approve two. And they're summarized on the agenda paper. Um, can I ask Councillor Golding, is it this time to um, introduce? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I will do a very brief introduction. Um, as with our revenue budget, our capital programme has also been impacted by COVID-19. Um, it is usually rare for the first quarter to show any significant spend, even in an average year. Oh, but, in, burn, but in this instance, it is likely that there will be further delays in oh, spend yeah. if key projects cannot be deli um, delivered to the original timescale. Our capital programme is vital to the borough and it's one way we can support investment into our local infrastructure. Therefore, it is good to see that although spend may be delayed in the current year, the bulk is still forecast to be spent across the capital programme up to 23-24, um, with a variance of just £300,000 across the MTFS period. We continue to be ambitious with our plans, ensuring that both large projects such as the 5G Living Lab in Basingview and smaller community facilities such as Stratton Park Tennis Courts have the investment that they require. And I therefore commend this report for approval by council. Thank you very much. Is anybody seconding that? Councillor Isaac is. Thank you very much, Councillor Isaac. Thank you, Mrs. Lady Mayor. I don't have any other speakers. Can you indicate if you have any dissent on this? No. Therefore, that is approved. The two point, the eight, the first eight points are noted, and the second points nine and ten are approved. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number ten. The appointment of the Chief Executive and the Head of Paid Service. Uh, the recommendation is found on page 77 to 88 of the agenda paper. Um, I think it's Councillor Edwards who will be introducing. Thank you. So I think it's Councillor Rattigan on this occasion. Councillor Rattigan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the recommendation is to appoint Russell O'Keefe. But before you move to a vote, I'd just like to express my thanks to uh, the councillors involved in that, to 
officers, both the executive team and to other officers who took part in the, in the process. It was a uh, difficult process during a COVID period where we could not obviously see uh, the applicants or as many as we wanted in the flesh to, to ensure that we got the right calibre through to our shortlisting. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to Councillor Tony Jones, who was steadfast in his view that we ought to, for the final element of this process, have the uh, candidates uh, on that shortlist through to a live meeting of us in the Human Resources Committee. I think it added an element of realism because for many of us who have got sat through many virtual meetings, there is a, a sense of distance when we are uh, on a screen, a sense that it's not quite real. And for a position as important and as vital to this borough as our new chief executive, it was a telling um, uh, intervention from him to make sure that we had a live uh, shortlisting and a run through from the final three candidates. So I just want to express to you all how useful that was and his experience on council helped us in our decision making. But it is a vital role for us going forward, one that um, meets, uh, we want a chief executive who meets the ambition, but also some of the trust that we all have to have in our leaders. Um, it is important that the role of chief executive combines that of head of paid service to support um, the, the officer class, but also has the, the trust of us as members that we can go to them with any issues, both large and small, and it can be a trusted place for us to, to feed off them. I, I believe that Russell O'Keefe, in not just his presentation to us finally, or as in the shortlist, but in all of the interactions between officers, ourselves, and the outside individuals who helped us in the process, has proven to be an excellent uh, candidate for, for your approval tonight. Therefore, I recommend his appointment tonight by yourselves on this full council. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Councillor Rattigan. Is that seconded by you, Councillor Edwards? Yes, thank you. Do you want to say any further? Um, just that I'm looking forward to Russell joining the council and a new chapter and everything's very exciting. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. Um, now, I'm assuming we won't have dissent, but if anybody does have a problem or wants to um, express dissent, can you raise your hand now? Okay, thank you very much. I therefore confirm the decision of the Council to approve the appointment of Russell O'Keefe as Chief Executive and Head of Paid Services. Thank you. Item number 11. Um, a report on the decision to enter into a joint agreement with Hampshire County Council for the continued provision of waste and recycling facilities. Um, this report can be found on pages 89 to 104 of the papers. And this is one of the occasions when a decision had to be made under urgency procedure rules as specified in the constitution. Councillor Rattigan, would you introduce and explain please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we sometimes have to make very quick decisions in a time of a, a COVID crisis. And I am, uh, I'd like to thank my uh, fellow group leaders again for their, for their involvement in all of the things that we do through our emergency powers um, and this urgency decisions. Um, I would ask you to note the, the contents of the report. Uh, I believe it's well set out uh, in the papers uh, and therefore, I would ask you to approve and note what is contained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are we all happy to say that that is noted? Um, the correct procedure was obviously followed and the necessity to make this urgent decision was discussed and affirmed by the Chief Executive, the Monitoring Officer, Group Leaders, Chair of Scrutiny and Mayor. Uh, if I don't see any raised hands, 
um, I will therefore say that this has been noted. Thank you very much. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is item 12, the annual report of the Standards Committee in, on page 105 to 110. Don't think anybody's due to speak to this one, unless anybody wishes to. No comments? Therefore, I propose that this is noted. Thank you very much. Item 13. Item 13, amendment to the officer scheme of delegation. I don't think anybody's down to introduce this either, but I will just say by way of explanation, this is a minor revision and it can be found on pages 111 to 116. As a result of legislative changes, we must, that we have to respond to. The scheme of delegation in our constitution has been amended to give two extra minor powers for the head of planning, sustainability and infrastructure. And those two amendments can be found on page 113, section three. Bonjour, Madam Mayor. My paper agenda doesn't go that far. It ends at item 12 on page 105. Just a moment. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councillor Robson. I think we have to agree that that's a bit of a printing error. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> for, your, for, your, for your benefit, I will just tell you what the two extra, extra powers are. Thank you. They are to determine applications for the modification, modification of conditions relating to construction working hours pursuant to various sections in the Town and Country Planning Act, and to determine application for additional environmental approval relating to the extension of certain planning permissions pursuant to various sections of the Town and Country Planning Act. If anybody has any problem, Councillor Paul Harvey, what would you like to say? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, can I talk to page 112 and there's the two little bullet points on 2.1 and I want to talk to the first one relating to working hours, please. Um, well, I appreciate that the government in its wisdom has taken the view to relax these powers so that developers can apply for longer working hours on sites. The consequences of some of these are significant for our residents. And I think my concern relates to, while I totally respect the matter has been delegated to our head of planning in the context of a 14 day consultation period or the need to respond within 14 days. May I make a plea for local ward members to be directly consulted on such applications because we have one live at the moment that involves residents who will be living on a site next door to development where a developer is seeking to extend their hours well into the evening, well into the evening, uh, that will have a direct disruption on their lives. And there is very little I think that we can do about it, but if we can, we hope to. But in the context of this particular power, I think if the, if the officers are willing, well, we don't necessarily want to seek to make any amendments, and I'm certainly not trying to, I would really appreciate them consulting us on any applications they get as ward councillors. So at least then we can have an input and guide what may or may not be the outcome of this, because it's going to have an impact on our residents. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. I'm looking at our... our head of legal services and she's uh, indicating that that is noted thank you very much thank you could you again please if you have any problem if you have any dissent on this could you raise your hands now okay that is therefore carried thank you very much now we move on to oh the motion haha now, the motion relates to Commonwealth and Nepalese veterans. And I would like to ask Councillor Freeman if you would introduce it, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, we have been working on an amendment to address issues brought to us by our Armed Forces Champion and hope that the following amended version, which I believe Dave Burns has circulated via email to you all, uh, will be something that all councillors can support. Um, I'm sure all councillors can agree that Commonwealth veterans have had a long and proud history of service in the British military, 
from conflicts old and new. Uh, and the veterans have served with distinction alongside British born veterans. Uh, however, when their service is complete, many are left with extortionate charges to remain in the UK. And this is something that the Royal British Legion is currently challenging the government over. Uh, Commonwealth veterans are supposed to receive indefinite leave to remain in the UK. However, many veterans state that the army failed to inform them that they needed to make an immediate application to the Home Office for remain to leave in the UK when their service is complete. Uh, we understand that there is a resettlement process, but uh, a lot of times it seems that these processes have not been adhered to and paperwork has not been received by veterans until long after the 12 week deadline to apply for leave to remain has expired. Uh, many people thought, many veterans thought the process was automatic and yet this is not the case. And fees for indefinite leave to remain have also dramatically increased. Since 2015, the fees have increased by nearly 127%, with a family of four having to pay nearly £10,000 to remain in the UK. And this figure doesn't include associated legal fees that some who have struggled with immigration applications may wish to pay. This can lead to many facing spiralling debt and uncertain immigration status because if a veteran is unable to pay, then they and their family face the prospect of taking on large amounts of debt or failing to pay and leaving their immigration status in doubt and facing the very real prospect of deportation. Whilst there are applications on ongoing Commonwealth, whilst their applications are ongoing, Commonwealth veterans are also a, unable to seek um, un, uh, to seek employment or claim benefits, leaving them very uh, in very reduced circumstances. And I believe uh, Councillor Waldridge will go into more detail on um, some of the cases that have uh, been noted. Uh, sadly, there are hundreds of cases where the processes have uh, not been adhered to or have failed to work. And with recruitment from the Commonwealth increasing, this injustice will continue to linger for the foreseeable future. I believe that this is a poor reward for people we have persuaded to leave their home countries in order to serve in the British Armed Forces. And it is a poor reward for those who have been willing to put their lives on the line in service of this nation. I believe they deserve better. And so to you, I propose the amended motion and ask that all councillors can support something to be put in place that will ensure anyone who has given up their time to serve in our military forces is uh, not adversely affected when it comes to the end of their time of service. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Freeman. So just for the sake of clarity, the motion is the amended motion, which we've seen on our screens and we all have in our inboxes. Thank you very much for coming to that agreement. Um, Councillor Waldridge, do you want to speak now or later? I'll speak now if that's okay. Yes, thank please you. Do. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'd like to focus on the experience of um, Fiji born veteran, Teitusi Rat Ratu Kau Kau. Um, to explain why I'm asking members to support uh, this motion this evening. Um, his experience highlights the issues faced by some Commonwealth veterans who have no settler status, the uncertainty and deep injustice that they can feel. This spring, a Tetusi collapsed and was rushed to a London hospital. He was found to have a brain tumour needing urgent, urgent surgery. He was told that he'd be treated as an overseas patient due to his immigration status. This meant a hospital bill of £30,000, um, which he clearly wasn't able to pay. So he had to rely on, a, on, uh, on the uncertainty of a crowdfunding appeal to secure the money for his operation. Back in 2011, Tetusi was given 28 days notice that he was no longer needed by the British Army. His decade of service included a tour in Iraq in 2003, and Afghanistan, Afghanistan in 2008 to 2009. He also signed a 22 year contract when he first was recruited to the army. On discharge, he believed he had the legal right to remain in the country which he had served for more than 10 years and um, which had become home for him and his family. Um, and, he, and he also believed he had the indefinite leave to remain there. Um, 
he uh, since being discharged from the army, uh, he, he carried on working and, and um, however, more recently has been prevented from working due to, due to confusion about his immigration status. Uh, subsequently, his tax credits have stopped and his only income for his family was the uh, child benefit for his third child. From 2012, the Home Office started tightening the uh, immigration regulations for Commonwealth veterans and, uh, and they've been squeezed by the system. Um, Commonwealth ve veterans can apply for indefinite leave to remain for themselves and their family if they've completed four years of service. But many struggle to do this due to the rising costs of visas, which have increased to as much as 2,381 per household member. Unable to, to afford these visas, Commonwealth veterans are left in a, a state of legal limbo with regard to their immigration status, finding it uh, difficult to access work, income, housing, and as we've, we've seen in Tetus's case, even urgent medical help. I'm sure you will agree that this is completely unacceptable. Even before the operation, Tetusi, along with others, had already launched a legal challenge. Their argument is that the MOD and Home Office failed to explain the complex and expensive immigration rules specifically for those discharged before 2013. To date, the government has not responded positively or adequately enough to resolve this issue. Um, nearly 7% of troops currently in service are from outside the UK. Uh, the Army have more than 5,000 troops from the Commonwealth and um, we uh, need to treat these troops better than this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll be very brief because I know that others want to speak. Um, I would like to pay tribute to the work that our armed forces do in resettlement. Um, a tremendous amount of effort that goes on behind the scenes and others more qualified than I will have more to say on it. Uh, and uh, the British Legion for its ongoing work trying to address these, some of these issues on the financial side. Um, I'll put it very simply. If you fight for this country, you're effectively a citizen of this country. So I would like to see um, a much more um, equal approach um, adopted when we have um, people coming to the end of their service, active service in many cases. Um, and what I would like to see um, is something equivalent to what I understand um, the Gurkhas had granted to them in 2004, which was the right to remain. They have three years service I'd like to see four years service for Commonwealth veterans and uh, citizenship after 12 years of service. It's not a lot to ask, given the amount of time they have put in serving this country. They have shared the same circumstances as British born soldiers. Their families have lived side by side. They've taken um, enemy fire in many cases. Um, you know, we owe it to them to look after them afterwards. And I know that the ongoing treatment and support in the armed forces has improved tremendously over the last 30 or 40 years. There are things that we know a lot more about now, the, the life-changing injuries that people uh, survive now that wouldn't have survived 40 years ago, um, the better uh, mental health support that's out there. Uh, and I'm sure in the fullness of time, uh, you know, if we flag these issues now, I'm sure that relatively quickly they will be addressed. Uh, so we don't have the unfortunate situation uh, where we have servicemen and women um, having to find large sums of money, having questionable in immigration status, uh, being caught on the hop, that they have a more managed transition. And I understand that different countries in the Commonwealth have different immigration arrangements mm. with our country. But at the end of the day, if you fought this country, you've effectively been a citizen of this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Simon Bound. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Whilst others will talk about the detail in this motion, I would like to highlight why the spirit of it is so important. I support the calls for more to be done to educate people about the contribution the Gurkha soldiers have made to Britain's military. The Gurkha's bravery on the battlefield is legendary 
and more than 46,000 have died fighting for Britain. They have also received 26 Victoria Crosses. The Gurkhas have spent part of the Brit uh, sorry, the Gurkhas have been part of the British military for more than 200 years, but it wasn't until 2009 that they won the right to live in the UK. For us locally, we need to understand that we have one of the largest um, communities and concentrations of Gurkhas who've chosen to settle in Britain and call our communities home. This summer's events have highlighted the challenges of integration in Britain, both within and outside the Gurkha and Nepalese community. The pressures of all of this and living far from home can prove too much for some. Three years ago, the project we Are Gurkhas saw veterans visiting schools in North Hampshire to talk about their service to a younger generation who knew little about the regiment. I know members in this virtual room will better understand what they have done for us over the years. As the Nepalese prepare to celebrate Diwali next month, I hope the Hindu Festival of Light will also help to illuminate the contribution the Gurkhas have made to the British way of life and their desire to be part of it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and can I thank the people for bringing the motion forward, the councillors for bringing the motion forward. I think the Nepalese community is such a crucial part of our borough, as has just been said. And I think we need to recognise, and I'm sure we all do, the amazing contribution the Nepalese and Commonwealth communities make to our communities. And I know that in Norden for the very simple point of the number of Nepalese uh, residents we have uh, and the amazing contribution they make to, to what goes on in our community. And I want to pay tribute to that because that is a sign, a signal to us of the way we, all of us, including the government, should be honouring the debt we have to them and their families. And I see it as that regard. It is a debt that we owe them for the service they have given this country. And in that sense, I think, you know, I was really privileged. I was very privileged for a number of years to teach at the Defence Academy. And I was very humbled by the stories, by the men and women that I came through, uh, taught over that period. Um, many of them were Nepalese, many of them were our Commonwealth veterans. Um, and it really impressed upon me personally how important this issue is. So I think this is a moral question. I see this as an absolute moral question. And for those servicemen and women in our Commonwealth who have defended us, who have put their lives on the line, and I think it's important as well, it's not just for the servicemen and women who have done so, it is for their families, because their families have given them up to our military in order that they gave us service. It is for their families as much as it is for them that we owe the debt. And that's a very important point, I think. So access to the NHS, access to services, having a free and positive part to be in our society is the very least, the very least we should be saying when they sign to become a soldier, an airman, a Navy, whatever in terms of their service, when they sign up to do that, they and their families, in effect, sign that contract with us and we must honour that with them, absolutely clearly so. So for me, I really do struggle with current government policy. I feel so strongly on this, the current government policy, and it doesn't matter who the government is, any government needs to put this right. Current government policy is abhorrent in this area because it does not honour that debt. It is immoral and it needs to change. It really, really does. Our Commonwealth veterans deserve the full support that we can offer them. And the bit I like about the motion is the fact that we're asking our local MPs to do something. So I'm looking to them to pay heed to their elected councillors and our communities if we pass this motion to take this into parliament and to take this to government so that we do see change. Because while the motion has very fine words and what we say here is all words, the only thing that's going to make a blind bit of difference is if government act and the injustice is stopped. And that's generally how I see it. It is such a moral issue. So thank you for bringing the motion. I will be supporting the motion and I hope the actions that come from this will see real change and that morality will be honoured, that debt will be fulfilled because we do. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Councillor Frost. 
Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. 30 odd years ago, okay, um, certainly far more years than I care to remember, I too took the King's shilling or the Queen's shilling and joined the army, uh, going to Sandhurst and then, uh, and then progressing through. Uh, unfortunately, I was very badly injured, okay, uh, in live firing. And I have to say that uh, it's only thanks really to, uh, I believe, okay, uh, the Gurkha force who uh, were playing the enemy force against us um, in, uh, in live firing, okay, that uh, I, I believe that certainly my life and definitely my leg was saved. Um, I, I was very, very humbled to actually bump into um, one of the Gurkhas who, who actually helped me off the, uh, uh, the field uh, and into, uh, into an ambulance um, and he was working in a security job and luckily uh, he too, you know, uh, he, he was very, very lucky in the fact that uh, he was able to have the, the, the right to live in the UK. But having been through a medical uh, discharge in the armed forces, even though it was a number of years ago, okay, um, I appreciate that uh, there is an immense amount of support for veterans, okay, um, from the regiments, from the corps, okay, and the Ministry of Defence, right the way through to the British Legion, okay, uh, that, that we, we have at the moment. However, you know, um, when, when you come to leave the armed forces, okay, it is such a big disruption in your life, okay, and there are so many things that you need to organise that sometimes people saying something to you about the right to remain, okay, can get lost in all the, the noise, okay, uh, of you trying to rearrange, okay, uh, or uh, uh, rearrange schools, okay, accommodation, and, and generally, okay, uh, establish your own life. So whilst I, I understand there is the, uh, an immense amount of support, okay, for, uh, for uh, soldiers coming to the end of their service, okay, I, I can understand why sometimes, you know, things do get lost, Okay, uh, in translation or however you want to put it. So I'm fully supportive of this motion, um, and you know uh, I'm I like Councillor Harvey. I too am looking to our elected uh, MPs to uh, to lobby the government and put this right. Okay, I, I'm very proud uh, to say that I will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Frost. That's a moving story from your own experience. Very good to hear. Yeah. Councillor Kim Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm supporting uh, this motion and in particular the need to write these letters and impress upon the urgency, mainly because of my background and my family have a very long tradition of service in our armed forces over many, many generations. My great uncles, two of them went off and suffered the worst of trench warfare in the First World War, and unfortunately, only one of them came back. They served alongside Commonwealth servicemen. My own father and uncles have seen service all over the world and action, whether that be in places like Cyprus, the Falklands, or in Northern Ireland. And I know how much my own father was extremely proud to have had a unit of Gurkhas serve with him in those circumstances and how upset most ex-servicemen and current servicemen are about the fact that their comrades frequently do not get the same benefits and the same treatment that they do themselves. In the newer generation of my family, my nephew, who is in fact a Commonwealth citizen and served as a Commonwealth citizen, not just served, but also, as in, is often the case, sacrificed and in the course of his service suffered life changing injuries, subsequently competing in the in Invictus Games. Luckily for him, he has dual nationality and therefore does not have to suffer the additional severe hurt of potentially being countryless or feeling countryless at the end of their service. As 
successive governments, really, irrespective of political colour, have been slow to act to redress these issues. Okay, we've done work, but it's took a lot of years to help the Gurkhas. And there are still 25,000 Gurkhas who live in pension poverty of less than 2,000 a year. We're only now just getting round to dealing with the issue of Afghan interpreters. And at the moment, we have some 6,000 Commonwealth troops in service in the country. And so I think it's really important that our leader writes these letters and applies pressure because we cannot go on at the snail's pace that we do as a country to recognize not just the service, but the sacrifice that comes with that service uh, for all of our servicemen um, that serve that our origins are outside the UK. And I, and I am pleased that there has been so much support for this. And I recommend that we accept this motion. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Miller. Madam Mayor, thank you very much. Um, I was very pleased to be able to uh, cooperate with the proposer and the seconder of this motion. Uh, to make a contribution to the amended motion. Um, yes, uh, obviously, as the Armed Forces Champion, uh, it so happens I did 25 years in the military directly, but I've served all the time in the defence environment for uh, well over 40 years. And I've been overseas with the Gurkhas. I've served with them. Uh, and my admiration for them is uh, there's, there's no bounds to it. Um, I agree with the comments made that successive governments have been slow to act in this particular area. But uh, yesterday, I spent most of the day at a conference, a virtual conference of the Armed Forces Champions nationally. There were 244 of us in the conference on Zoom. And now, believe you me, if you think this is crowded, you want to get on one of those. But it was uh, focusing on the fact that the Armed Forces Act is being reviewed in Parliament currently and the Armed Forces Covenant to which this Council is signed up for and has been um, attached to for since 2013 is being passed into law next year. Now I think this is very apposite that the timing of this motion uh, will be able to be seen from the MPs to be I would hope to include these kind of points to be brought to the floor of the House of Commons during the debates and the committee stages of this particular bill. Um, I think if nothing else, it would raise the profile of this, these particular issues uh, within the halls of parliament. Whether I, I can't predict what the action is going to be, but at least there's raising the profile. The more people you get on your side, the better it is. Uh, I thoroughly approve of the motion um, and I will be supporting it. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, we're getting near the end of the allocated time, but obviously we do want to hear from people, but perhaps it could be fairly speedy. I've got two more speakers before the summing up. Councillor Rattigan first. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'd like to thank the proposer and seconder of, of the motion. I would be delighted to write the letters in support of the, the motion as the father of a serving RAF um, individual. I, I feel very passionately about our armed forces and certainly the connection to our Commonwealth friends. Uh, it is an important issue for, for them that they need stability in their life, not just while they are serving in our armed forces, but as they leave the forces, and move on to other things within our communities of which in the main they contribute hugely. So um, this is not a problem for me and I am delighted that this has been brought to my attention uh, and you will have every ounce of my support in making sure that the House of Commons through our three MPs and our, our Prime Minister and our Armed Forces Minister understand how 
we feel about this as a council. So thank you for bringing it and you have my total support. Thank you very much, Councillor Rettigan. And finally, Councillor Putty. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I am really privileged that in my term of office as mayor, that the covenant was signed. And I hope that this is going to be taken to parliament and really whether it is ratified or what, but uh, it is taken and positively done. But uh, when talking about uh, the Gurkhas, at the beginning when they came to UK, they were called Gorkhas. I don't know how many people know, they were really called Gorkhas. And then the name was changed to Gorkhas. But the thing is that with uh, everything to do with um, immigration, not only for the veterans and the army people, but we have got so much problem. If you travel that the journey, with many, many Commonwealth uh, uh, people who have immigrated to this country. The problem not only lies with um, uh, our uh, immigration rules, etc., but it's uh, at Croydon Lunar House, there's a swamp there. And that swamp needs to be really cleaned because it's still, uh, the people who are coming on highly skilled migrant uh, scheme, they are suffering a hell of a lot also in that particular journey. So all I can say, I congratulate the mover and second and the, all the people who have talked about this. And I am really gratified to see that we are all of the same opinion. And I also, I, I would vote for this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Putty. Uh, Councillor Freeman, do you want to sum up for us? Thank you very much. I'd just like to say it's been wonderful to hear all the stories and fantastic to receive so much support for this motion. It's, it's good to see we all feel that, that these people deserve more than what they get currently for their service. So I'd like to propose the motion and I hope you will all support it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Freeman and uh, Councillor Woodridge for bringing that. Um, quite clearly, I think um, I'm not being super sensitive if I sense that there's unanimous disagreement on this motion. But um, just to be absolutely sure, can I ask for virtual hands up if anyone is not in favour of this motion? Uh, Councillor Harvey, that was an actual hand. No, <laughs> I thought not. Um, I thought you wanted hands in support, not hands to say no. <laughs> No, this is just to save a roll call. I'm sure it isn't necessary on this occasion. Uh, clearly, we are unanimously in favour of this motion and it is therefore carried. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, questions from members of the Council on notice. Um, we've received three on notice. Um, the first is from Councillor Cubitt to the Cabinet Member for Planning, Infrastructure and Natural Environment. Councillor Cubitt. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going to read it for the benefit of um, um, the recording. Members attended a council briefing last week on a study commissioned by Hampshire County Council on how to improve the connectivity between Reading, Wokingham, Bracknell and Basingstoke. Central to the study appears to be an option to dual carriage the A33 and link the M4 to the M3. A couple of years ago, members were explicitly told by external experts at an EPH scrutiny meeting that if the A33 was dual carriaged, it would render Basingstoke a dormitory town for Reading's businesses and that it would damage Basingstoke's business parks. Could Basingstoke Council tell my residents why it supported and part financed a study commissioned by Hampshire County Council with a remit that entails at its heart a proposal which would damage our businesses and make us a dormitory town for Reading. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Raphael. 
Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, once again, the wording of the question as tabled is different from the question orally articulated. Just for the avoidance of doubt, Madam Mayor, we have not paid for this study. It has been paid for by the highways authorities. For the avoidance of doubt, it was not our idea. Uh, it was set up for different reasons, namely to explore the links between the M4 and the M3. Uh, and uh, that's something that perhaps it's hard to criticise. And when you're looking at the other authorities, because it may well be that we don't ha have any particular difficulty of getting to the M4, um, some might say it's a bit slow on the road to Newbury, but uh, if you are an authority such as Wokingham and you're trying to get to the M3, you've got gridlock uh, most directions from Wokingham, especially if you try to go through Bracknell. So uh, it's no surprise that they're, they're coming up with these ideas. It's a question of uh, where these ideas take them. And it would have been wrong for us to have ignored this and uh, to have not had a seat at the table. Uh, our seat at the table um, is at an officer level, not at a member level, because it is the county councillors who've been attending this and they have, although we hadn't heard anything from them as to what they heard, because they didn't tell us. Uh, and uh, it, this, the assumption in the question is that our economy would be damaged by better transport links to Reading. I disagree. I think uh, I think we live in a, the sort of economy that better transport links links benefit everybody. But the, the, so if we had better rail links to Reading, a Chinham station and whatnot, I, I don't think that would be something we should say. Oh, we shouldn't have that because uh, it would harm our economy. I disagree with whatever we were told on an earlier occasion. However, the reason that we had this briefing is because, uh, well, put it bluntly, is one hundred percent down to me. I found out this was going on and I wanted to bring it out into the open so that all members uh, could find out about it. And in particular, I want to make sure that the wards along the A33 members could come to it and members from all political parties did attend. Uh, and we made it clear in those discussions. And I have to say, I think that the uh, consultants Atkins were listening to us because they said that we'd said a number of things they hadn't heard before, um, was that uh, dueling the A33 in the midsection will only result in more traffic traveling through Basingstoke. It won't actually benefit Basingstoke. And I dare say um, it may benefit the other economies, but I suspect it'd be more people traveling through them as well. Um, currently, there are benefits to the 40 mile per hour average speed on the A33 because there are a number of schools on the route and there's a number of um, uh, housing estates and the like along the way, which um, the last thing they want to do is be moving on to fast moving traffic. Um, uh, so I, the, the slower speeds benefit uh, the borough, for, borough at the moment. Um, any proposal to uh, straighten the route, uh, 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 make it more direct um, to the M3 uh, or indeed to bypass old basing, uh, we made it abundantly clear would be highly controversial uh, and uh, was likely to main, meet with substantial um, protest. And I don't think they were particularly keen to hear that at all. Um, meanwhile, we uh, heard and we were pleased to hear that, as I'd already told some members previously, the proposal to uh, um, look at developing a Chinham station and indeed uh, the deputy mayor uh, made it clear that uh, a station towards Oakley ought to be looked at as well. Um, it was uh, they were gaining some traction in this process and it may well be that uh, that is the, uh, the area where improved transport links uh, should be focused or possibly from some extension of mass rapid transport rather than um, looking at uh, uh, improving what will become a, a national strategic route and has no benefit to the local population. So um, I think uh, the deputy mayor can be reassured and uh, the members uh, who, uh, of the wards who live in that area, whether that be Chinham, um, Old Basing, or even Stratfield Turgis, uh, that, there, that the, any proposals to duel the M3, um, uh, sorry, the A, A33, uh, have not gained traction with me. Um, and if anything, I'm not convinced by the power of those arguments at the moment. So uh, I, think, uh, I think there would be a coalition uh, against it from that part of the borough.
Thank you very much for that answer. Councillor Cubitt, do you have a supplementary question? No? Okay, thank you very much. In that case, I'll ask Councillor Jones, please, to ask his question to the Cabinet yeah. Member for Environment and Enforcement. Councillor Jones. Thank you, uh, as on the older paper, so I have some more time. Councillor Eaches. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Jones. Just to reassure Councillor Jones, there is a lot of work going on with the officer team and myself in relation to bring banks. Um, they obviously provide access across the borough for the disposal of glass, cardboard and paper, we aluminium and mixed recycling, but then a lot of them also provide residents with the opportunity to donate items to various charities. There has been a significant downturn in the recyclable material values, and as such, many of the charity operators are reconsidering their options in the area. There's also the fact that glass, paper, card, um, cardboard, they're all collected uh, curbside for our residents. So we are looking at the ongoing demand for all of the bring banks uh, across the borough because there is a number of sites. The ongoing review is looking at sites which are subject to fly tipping because we do understand that that's a, a big issue. And we are looking at what sites might best be suited to CCTV as a pre prevention to fly tipping. Um, I hope to uh, have a report towards the end of this year. Um, we hope to have it earlier, but there's just so much work and so many sites and we want to do a thorough job. I do want to make clear that fly tipping is absolutely not tolerated in the borough. We've had three successful fly tipping prosecutions uh, on Tuesday the 6th of October. Three people were ordered to pay over £6,000 between them for illegally dumping waste. And this clearly demonstrates our resolve to stamp out this illegal activities. Two of these convictions were fly tipping at bring sites. Bays and Soak and Dean is really proactive in carrying out fly tipping enforcement. The council has the second number, uh, sorry, the second highest number of fly tipping convictions in Hampshire over the past 18 months, with many more prosecutions in the pipeline. Zero tolerance does not mean we can commit everyone. I wish it did, but we can't. All that the provision of CCTV is a silver bullet to eliminate in fly tipping. However, zero tolerance does mean that where we have the opportunity to secure convictions, that that's exactly what this council will do. Installing CCTV is a useful tool in dealing with fly tipping in hotspot areas. And as I say, this is being looked at as part of the overall review of bring banks. There may well be localised benefits to the site which CCTV covers. However, this does not address the underlying behaviour problem or mean that a a, an offence does not then end up occurring elsewhere. Um, Publicising the serious consequences of fly tipping is a key element to our strategy to achieve a behavioural change and we will continue to publicise the outcome of successful prosecutions. We will continue to take action against those who have found to commit this type of offence. And it's really important that the public report evidence of fly tipping to the council so that we can proceed with prosecutions. And we are really grateful to all the residents that do provide that evidence and that have done so far. Their support really is vital in taking action against those responsible because the witnesses are key. Thank you. Councillor Jones, do you have a supplementary question? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a bit disappointed that we're not moving a bit quicker with the CCTV, because I do believe that would stop a lot of it. And I'm glad you're looking at a review, but I'd, like, I'd wonder whether you could look at the whole thing as a review, the bulky waste collection as well, the cost of it, but the actual time that takes to actually pick it up now. I'm, I understand it's six to eight weeks of my colleague who's just had some stuff removed. That's not acceptable. I just wonder whether we could actually review the whole thing and bring it back perhaps to CEP again. I'll have to have a word with the chairman, but um, so in terms we're all of on the same line, but we need to move a bit quicker because all wards are suffering. It's not just the um, town walls, it's the rural walls as well. And if we had a mobile CC cameras, which they use in other boroughs, we could perhaps stop a lot of this. And I think some people were making a lot of money out of this fly tip. And it's not the households so much, it's some of these people who said, oh, I'll take this away for a couple of bob. And we, the council, end up with a big bill. So I do believe we should be reviewing it very quickly and it should come up to CEP. 
Thank okay, you. well, I can assure you, as I said, that there is a review that, I mean, this is a huge review of all the sites across the borough at all the different banks, all the charities, everything. And, you know, if you move bins, then the charities are still left there. Do, or lots, there's a huge, there is a review going on and it's massive. There will be a report. It is likely to come to CEP um, in the new year. And CCTV is an option. It's part of the whole review. That's why we're not rushing it. We're looking at it. But all the, I suppose we have to accept that CCTV is absolutely a useful tool in the hotspots areas. But though, um, there's also the issue that you, know, you can put up speed cameras in an area and it will deter people, but it doesn't stop people doing it all the time. And so it is just an option, an option that we're looking at. And in relation to bulky waste, well aware of the waiting lists. I know that. We've, we've got a whole team out there. They're working their best. Um, and there's not a great deal we can do. I mean, since lockdown, it has picked up massively. And I think, obviously, we're working with Hampshire to, to get them to have more slots at the HWRCs. And my last conversation with Hampshire, which is really important that residents understand, is that Hampshire are finding that residents are booking slots at the HWRCs and then just not turning up. And that's really not helpful for our bulky waste collection service because people are then deciding to use that instead of the HWRCs. And then if all these, and for Basinsoke, it's the worst in Hampshire at the moment for the slots that are being booked and people aren't turning up. So it's really to urge residents, if you are booking slots at the HWRCs, please use them or don't book them. So then hopefully that won't have the impact on our bulky waste service. But I can assure you this is all being looked at and a report is being done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now, Councillor Waldridge, would you give your question to the Cabinet Member for Homes and Families? I'm happy to go as, as it, it is on the order paper, please. Councillor Tristan Robinson. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And thank you to Councillor Waldridge um, for your question. Um, MHCLG's interventions, uh, as you outlined in your question, Councillor Waldridge, have been a, a range of measures in relation to the COVID response for private renters uh, and people in, in different uh, sectors of accommodation. Part of those measures for private renters have been uh, including increasing local housing allowance rates to the 30th percentile to protect tenants further and support them to stay in their homes. Throughout the pandemic to date, we have received fewer than half the inquiries that we would normally see from private renters regarding their security of tenure during the first six months of this financial year. Only a quarter of what we would normally see, i.e. half the inquiries that we've had, have had to access more intensive assistance and guidance from the team. And where it has been clear that homelessness may be a risk in the medium term, we have been able to intervene and secure alternative ac affordable accommodation rather than simply waiting for homelessness to occur. At the same time, I've uh, checked in with the benefits team and there has not yet been an increase in financial support required through discretionary housing payments within the housing benefits system compared to the situation that we had in the borough pre-COVID. In terms of uh, what we will do moving forward, um, as uh, as you rightly outlined in your question, Councillor Waldridge, it's, it's a concern that although we haven't seen any particular issues here to date that we haven't been able to manage effectively, it's about looking at what we do in the future. And as part of our housing and homelessness strategy, homelessness prevention is a specific policy objective uh, within that. And to ensure the most vulnerable in our community receive the uh, support that they need. This means for us not simply reacting um, to homelessness once it's occurred, but being strategic, looking ahead, mitigating the impact of challenges and pressures on individuals to make sure that those individuals don't become homeless in the first place. Uh, the current uh, private rented sector position assessment uh, shows that locally, the ongoing provision of timely advice and assistance from our fantastic team of specialist officers within the housing and be benefits teams have prevented our vulnerable residents from losing their homes in this difficult time or accruing excessive arrears, because that's a really important part of this as well. It's not just about residents who face the risk of losing their accommodation. It's about making sure that residents don't get into a difficult uh, financial position as a result of this. 
we'll make sure that we continue to be proactive uh, and in a in a couple of headlines our approach with regards to the private rented sector is to ensure that residents can access specialist advice support and financial assistance uh, and to make sure that that's accessible to those who need it to deliver targeted awareness and raising communications for private rented uh, persons raising the services and support available to make sure that they understand what support is available so that there's no cliff edge we continue to liaise closely with the courts and the specialist court desk service to ensure the right support is available continue to advise and work with uh, responsible private landlords and we do have uh, a, a good number of private landlords in Basingstoke and Dean where we have a good relationship um, to make sure that with our specialist landlord liaison officers we mediate between landlords and tenants where necessary should those difficulties arise to retain the use of our rent bond and PRS financial support schemes to help people stay in their homes or to move to more affordable alternative sustainable rented op options and outside of PRS, make sure that we continue to deliver new affordable homes, which last year exceeded our annual target and enabled 966 new homes to be advertised under the choice based letting system last year. Thank you very much. Have you got a supplementary, Councillor Woodridge? Um, uh, yes, I have, uh, if that's okay. Well, a couple actually. Um, well, I'll merge them into one. Um, the first one is um, thank you for your comprehensive answer, by the way. Um, you know, much of which I, I, I agree with. Uh, I, 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 I'm particularly pleased that you are going to be looking at targeted awareness. And, you know, but I was a, a little bit disappointed not to see something in, for example, at the Basingstoke. Uh, and Dean Today magazine that we've all got this week or, or last week, depending on what, where you live. Um, and, you know, that I think that would have been an ideal place to to reach out to private renters because not, not all of them would actually think to come to the council because be, due to COVID, we, we, we are, you know, the, the people who are possibly going to be in trouble in a few months time when, when, when this all kicks in it are going to be people who aren't aren't usually sort of hit by arrears and things like that. So I think, you know, that that is an area where, you know, you, you really need to sort of focus on. So I was pleased to hear that. Um, uh, my subsequent, uh, trend, supplementary question really is what, why you, you didn't, you haven't answered my question on about, um, I asked whether you would uh, approach Robert Jenrick about the no fault section 21 evictions and you, you seem to miss that out of your answer. So if you could just respond to that point, please. Thanks. Thank you. In, in regards to targeting awareness, you're, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that I'm very conscious of and, and the team are, are very conscious of is that the people affected during this pandemic aren't necessarily those people who would go through the usual channels, as you say. And we need to make sure that we uh, we get that communications message across uh, to people so that they come through the system. And that's both in terms of homelessness and the benefit situation as well. And it's about timeliness about making sure we get those messages out to the right people. And we're working very hard with the comms team on those messages, including on, on, on social media and um, more. With regard to uh, the minister, I'm more than happy uh, to uh, write to Robert Jenrick and ask him uh, about uh, the ongoing policies moving forward. And equally, um, I know that we are hoping to have the minister for rough sleeping visit Basingstoke in the in the upcoming months to see more and hear more um, from from our officers about the fantastic work that's been undertaken in Basingstoke to help combat homelessness and as part of that conversation I'm more than happy to to raise those issues of, of no fault evictions there. Excellent thank you thank you for raising that subject very good okay that's all of the questions um on notice. Uh, the next set of questions is to the Chair of Cabinet or Committee Chair. I haven't had any on notice. Uh, members, have you have a list of committee meetings in order of date taking place. Um, right, I can see there are a couple of questions. When you ask the question, can you make it clear exactly um, what the committee is and what the section is that you're speaking about? Councillor Regan. Am I live now? Yes, anyway. I can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm having trouble seeing the stuff. Um, I refer to the council meeting of the 16th of July, uh, minute 
3420, which is questions to share, referring little one, uh, referring to CEP meeting held of the 24th of June, when I asked the question about uh, why the option was not taken up to, to purchase the Camrose football ground and develop it as a sports complex. I was promised by the cabinet member a, uh, a written response, which I'm yet to receive. So can I ask when I'm gonna be furnished with a written response? Thank you. Um, you have to identify yourself. Is that Councillor Isaac? No, yeah. it's Councillor Councillor Bean. Bean. Councillor Bean, could you respond? Um, yes, I am very sorry, Councillor Reagan, if you've not had a written response. I am happy to get one out to you as soon as possible, but I am sure now through um, different mediums, it's been quite well articulated why we will not be purchasing the cameras. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Reagan, that will be forthcoming. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Mayor. And Councillor Gary Watts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's on the same minute, on the same night. Uh, on my also my question, the portfolio holder promised a, a detailed written response, and I haven't received one either. I just wonder if we I could have a response to my question of the night, and also could have a an update on the council's position as well in light of the uh, development control rejecting the outline planning permission <clears throat> for 85 homes on the Camro site uh, due to not for a like for like um, stadium um, replacement at Winkerbury. Thank you. So thank you, Councillor Watts. Um, again, I'm sorry that you have not received a response. I'm happy to get that out to you. However, I don't think the second point is in relation to, to any of those minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, thank you. Well, finally, the last two items on the agenda. Um, we have no reason to exclude the press and public as we have no confidential or exempt items to consider. I can therefore declare this meeting of the